Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvina Vaditamastu Mavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om, may the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good evening, everyone, and namaste. Welcome to our reading and discussion of Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga. We are on, we are well along in his talk, The Real and the Apparent Man. And uh, he's been saying some very startling things. Before uh, we move on, is there anything that anyone would like to offer? from what we've studied in the past, anything they'd like to say about it or anything that they'd like to express as a concern or a question. All right. Cosmic spheres and devils and gods and reincarnations and transmigrations are all mythology. So also is this human life. The great mistake that men always make is to think that this life alone is true. They understand it well enough when other things are called mythologies, but are never willing to admit the same of their own position. So I'm going to read that again. And if there are any things, if there's anything that people would like to say uh, about getting this clear, uh, let's let's get it now because he's going to go on from here. Cosmic spheres and devils and gods and reincarnations and transmigrations are all mythology. So also is this human life. The great mistake that men always make is to think that this life alone is true. They understand it well enough when other things are called mythologies, but are never willing to admit the same of their own position. Anything at all that we would like to say or ask about what this Swami has said? The whole thing, as it appears, is mere mythology. And the greatest of all lies is that we are bodies, which we never were, nor even can be. This is the greatest of all lies, that we are mere men. We are the God of the universe. In worshiping God, we have been 
always worship, worshiping our own hidden self. The gr it is the greatest of all lies that we are mere men and women. We are the God of the universe. In worshiping God, we have been always worshiping our own hidden self. The worst lie that you ever tell yourself is that you were born a sinner or a wicked person. That person alone is a sinner who sees a sinner in another man. Suppose there is a baby there baby here. Suppose there is a baby here and you place a bag of gold on the table. Suppose a robber comes and takes the gold away. To the baby it is all the same because there is no robber inside. There is no robber outside. To sinners and vile men there is vileness outside but not to good men. So the wicked see this universe as a hell, and the partially good see it as a heaven. When the perfect beings, while the perfect beings realize it is God himself, then alone the veil falls from their eyes, and that, and the man, the person, purified and cleansed, f cleansed, finds his whole vision changed. The bad dreams that have been torturing him for millions of years all vanish. And he who was the king thinking of the, and he who was thinking of himself Either as, either, ah, either as a man or as a god or as a demon, he was thinking of himself as living in low places, in high places on earth, in heaven, and so on, finds that he is really omnipresent, that all the time is in him and that all time is in him, and that he is not in time, that all the heavens are in him, and that he is not in any heaven, and that all the gods that man ever have that man ever worshipped are in him, and that he is not in any one of these gods. He was the manufacturer of gods and demons, of men and plants and animals and stones, and the real nature of man now stands unfolded to him as being higher than heaven, more perfect than his universe, than this universe of ours, more infinite than infinite time, more omnipresent than the omnipresent ether, this alone, thus alone, man becomes fearless and becomes free. Then all delusions cease, all miseries vanish, all fears come to an end forever birth goes away and with it death pains fly and with them fly away pleasures earths vanish and with them vanish heavens bodies vanish and with them vanishes the mind also
what is this Swami talking about here? What could he possibly ta be talking about? Here we sit together, joined by this incredible Zoom technology. What is he saying? Anyone have an answer? I am thinking, Brother Shankara, this is Haima. Yes, I he, he said, we are the God of the universe. And now that we understand this completely through all the books we have read and discussed and with your wisdom you shared with us, now that we know we have a piece of God within us, there's no going back to all the myths anymore. There's no going back because yes, myths were there. Our elders did say, yes, God is inside you too, but they never said you are the God of the universe. So, and they never said, behave like God. That's, that's what we all should be doing. Uh, part of God is manifested in all of us. A piece of him is in the entire universe everywhere. So what Swami is saying, we're the God of the universe. And we have been worshiping always our own hidden self, which is really uh, just amazing to know that. It's just stunning. We've Thank been you. worshiping, we have been worshiping us, thinking that we are worshiping some external figure, always, but he's already inside us. That's what I'm, I'm, I understand. Thank you, Haima. Sure, Brother Shaka. That's a good summary of some of the things that he said, yes. Anyone else care to contribute? Brother Shankara, this is McKaylee. Yes, McKaylee. Uh, I like to that it's, you know, God is us. He's within us. He's our real nature. And uh, it, it's like the whole world opens up. He was saying, when you see this, it's like, it's like an aha moment. It's like, you see everything differently at that point. And you realize that this is all illusionary. Everything that changes, it's not real. Only, only God is real. This is, again, a, a nice summary of part of what the Swami has said. Thank you, Michele. And And yes, all of that is true. And yet here we sit. What are we doing? What are we doing? What is this mythology that we're so enamored of? Because as Janaka said to a student, give me my teacher's fee before I tell you the truth. Because after I tell you the truth and you realize it, you will see no teacher, no student, no studying. Brother Shankara? Yes. Well, wouldn't you say that we're all here? We think we're here because it's our classroom. So every day we wake up, we have to go to school. And our school is life and it's our classroom. That's why we're here. But we've been had like by a magician. Yes, this is, this is one way of thinking about it, Michele. As, as, as Swami Prabhupada used to say, everyone loves the magic but no one wants to know the magician. Everyone loves the magic, but no one wants to know the magician. So as you said, but the, on, the only 
The only thing that I would take a little issue with is Michaelia's that we've been had. No, we've done it to ourselves. This is the great open secret. We persist in this, as Swami Sarvapriyananda said one morning, which was truly an aha moment for me that was sitting in his class. We do this, we know these truths that Swami Vivekananda has been talking about and that he had been expounding for some weeks in a class on Advaita Vedanta. He says, we know these things and we don't stop doing them. We don't stop participating in the mythology. He didn't say those words, but that's what he meant. Why not? Why do we keep doing this? Brother Shankara, do you think it's because there's a, there's a form of guilt or fear that no we carry material. on a subconscious level? That's not what he said. And, and, and I don't, from here, that doesn't seem the case either. The, it seems to be, and this is what the Swami said, and he raised his own hand. We do this because we like it. Like the Swami said a little while back, there is no sinner. We see guilt and shame and all of these things because we are engaged and entangled with the magic. But in fact, it does not exist. And what Swami Sarvapriyananda said, and that's what, from here, it was such an aha moment. We do this because we like it. And that's what. So, and there, is there anything wrong with liking it? No, it can't be wrong. Wrong in whose eyes? We're, it's not our business to please some God that's outside ourselves so that we're displeasing God as some uh, spiritual teachers or religious teachers will tell you. No, that's not it. What the point that is being made from here is that until we get it through our awareness, into our awareness, that we're doing this because we like it, there's no way for us to stop doing it because we have to stop liking it. We have to have, we have to stop liking the mythology. Does that make sense to everyone? And if it doesn't, that's fine. Take issue. Say what's on your mind. Brother, it's like going to a movie. So one part of the movie is that if it's not engaging enough, like I think there was a story where I think it's about Girish Ghosh or somewhere I read Girish Ghosh and Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar. It seems like Girish Ghosh was doing some sort of play. He was acting in his own play. And uh, in his play, he was acting like a villain. And then Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar was watching the show in the theater and he got so angry. He, he, he almost felt it is real and he threw a shoe at the actor. Yes. So it's, it's like that, uh, that it, because it is so engrossing and so beautiful, um, we, we sort of enjoy it and on the other hand if we free our uh, free ourselves out of that then you know we would not really want to watch it it's that's very good that's very well remembered that story about girish ghosh and vijasagar yes he did he got so angry that he threw a shoe at uh, at, uh, at at the actor girish ghosh you know, because he was being such a villain. Who threw the shoe? Uh, his name was uh, 
Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar. Uh, there's a section of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna uh, where uh, Sri Ramakrishna comes to his home. And it's one of the few times that you find that the master, unbidden, gives a lecture. Um, he gives a lecture on, 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 the, on the steamship when uh, Keshav Chandra Sen uh, comes and gets him and takes him on a steamship trip on the, on the Ganges with the, with the, uh, some of the, uh, some of Keshav Chandra Sen's followers. Um, Taku gives a talk, a lecture then. And it's a beautiful, it starts on page 132 of the gospel. But uh, it, it, when he goes to Vijayasagar's house, he gives Vijayasagar a lecture. And it's, it's a very fascinating lecture about the nature of reality for householders and particularly for wealthy uh, pillars of society kinds of households. The, th the thing that I'm driving at here is that there is a spectrum, a spectrum of our experience. There is the full immersion in the mythology, in which case there is no, nothing arises for the, the human being that is so immersed and entangled. They're fully, they, not, they don't even know that it's magic, let alone know that there's a magician. And then there is the other end of the spectrum that the Swami has been talking to us about here which is really only known to us in Samadhi, that this is all mythology. And it leaves you in a very peculiar state of mind because you're participating in the mythology and yet you know it is a mythology. And that's why the Swami said, when we're in that state of mind, in that peculiar state of mind that we know, and yet we continue, we have to admit we're doing it because something in us likes it. So we begin to awaken, we begin to understand that this is not what it appears to be. And then we come to a class like this one and we hear the Swami say, this whole shooting match, all of it, all of it is a mythology and a creation of the God that we are. Not that is within us. Yes, the, the dwelling place within the mythology of that God, as Sri Ramakrishna says, is the heart of the devotee. That is the... But that too is within the mythology. God is creating the drawing room. God is creating the human being that, whose heart the chakra whose heart space is the drawing room. And so it's when we well and truly, when we're well and truly tired of liking this, that we will make the supreme effort to renounce it.
Dr. Chakra? Yes, dear. Oh, I have a question. Is there any other way that a person can realize other than meditation and pranayam and mudras through Raja Yoga that divinity is within us and in the finding liberation? Is that the only route or is there any other routes that a human being can realize without meditation? Swami, just... Swami Vivekananda taught four. Mm -hmm. Karma route. Work or worship or psychic control or philosophy one or more or all of these and be free so meditation is a way to cause the mind to be still when the mind is still when there is no more vibration in the mind stuff of the body, that is the several nervous systems of the body, then you, then this automatically arises. That is true. Spontaneously, this truth spontaneously arises. Work. What does Swami mean by work? He means karma yoga as he explains it in his talks on karma yoga. And simply by service to others, one can learn what is necessary to become liberated, free, from the magician's magic. Thank you. The bhakta work or worship. The bhakta, the person pursuing the path of devotion, comes to see everything as the divine being and the, the, the glory of the divine being. This is the path of Sri Chaitanya. Chant the name of the Lord and his glory unceasingly, that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire, worldly lust, raging furiously within. This is his promise that pursuing the path of devotion will cause the, the mirror of the heart to be a perfect reflection of the truth and our entanglement and our, uh, in, in our hypnosis, our entrancement with the magician's magic, as he says, will be quenched. So those are the two paths. The third path is, of course, what you described, Haima. Yes. Med meditation. Yes, definitely. And this is bringing to the, the whole of the body to this state where it appears to be dead. Yes. It, there doesn't appear to be a sign of life left in it. This is the highest form of samadhi. And what happens in that state of realization cannot be described because the mind has been left behind. In the case of uh, Patanjali's system, Thank you, Brother Shankara. Definitely meditation reveals the divinity within us. But the, the, the path of philosophy, Other which is the path that the Swami has been taking us down here, uh -huh. it is the path of Vishishta, Adi Shankaracharya. Mm -hmm. And it simply says, annihilate 
the mind. Ignore everything having to do with it. That's the, that's the word that those jnanis use. Annihilate the mind. But this is what I say. This is, you have to be well and truly convinced. Your mind has to be very strong for you to practice that sort of renunciation. That's why there are the other three paths. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Lionel. Thank you. Any, Brother, any, when you say mind has to be strong, can you um, e explain that in terms of like, uh, what are the types of strengths that are required? Well, Rajiv, it's, it's just as simple as being able to say no to everything. What kind of mind can say no? Can say not this, not that, not this, not that, to everything that exists within the, the vibration of the mind stuff. The jnani does not still all that. They simply say no to all of it. What kind of mental strength is required for that? So many people say, oh, I'm practicing jnana. And by the way, I'm going this summer on a nice cruise, uh, so on and so forth. You think, well, they like the idea of jnana, but they are not practicing jnana at all. So it's the ability to say no to the entire mythology that the Swami has just described. Simply say absolutely and categorically no. To, to read about this, you can read Swami Vivekananda's inspired talks. And you can read a book about Nisargadatta Maharaj uh, called I Am That. Now, Nisargadatta Maharaj did not write that book. His followers wrote that book about him. So those are the If this seems daunting to you, well then welcome to the world of spiritual effort. Yes, it is daunting to practice any one of these yogas to the extent that you truly become free of the mythology. Brother, I guess it's a matter of like, getting some sweetness out of it as well, which is a little bit difficult, I guess, with this path, with this Gyan path. Like enjoyment and, you know, having a nice way till we reach there. But the, the, the Gyani simply says no to all of that. I think, I think you mean detachment, right, Brother Shankara? Uh, you don't have to be attached to it. I if you go it, you go it. No. The jnani says no to it. No to, no to it completely. It, it, it isn't a question of attachment or detachment. It's simply, no, this is not real. So I'll, I, won't, I won't enjoy it and not be attached to it. Hmm? This is the path of the bhakta or the karmi. Hmm? No, the jnani says, it's not real, I'm not having any. That's true. Thank you, Brother Shankar. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. 
anything else from anyone. This is very good what we're doing. We're getting clear what is meant by vanish. All of this vanishes it, vanishes. And with it vanishes heavens, bodies, It all vanishes. Now, we have no idea what it is for it to vanish, do we? We just don't. So we're taking this, Swami, it is my, it is work. And with them vanishes the mind also. The mind that is creating all this, projecting all. So anything else before we read on? We have plenty of time, so don't don't feel like we're not making good use of the time when we discuss these things. Maybe I think it's the ability to say no and yet somehow retain the will to live unless it, it gets withdrawn. Um, as an act of God or nature or by... It, it's said that the jnani, having achieved this state where the mind vanishes, they don't return to the body. If they do, they'll last no more than 21 days. And the reason for that is, is it's just vestigial karma. The only ones who stay and teach us are those who are They, they're somehow, there is a command for them to return. They retain just this tiny thread or shred of ego. As Sri Ramakrishna says, the ego of love or the ego of wisdom. And they return as Adi Shankaracharya did, as Jesus Christ did as Rama did, as all of these, having achieved the full uh, knowledge. Vashishta gave Rama the knowledge. Rama transcended the gunas, became part of that Turiya Turi state, the fourth, and then returned to fulfill his destiny within the mythology. The mythology is very complex, and we are doing it, all of us, as God, together. There is one, only one, behind all this. But it is infinitely creative and creates all these unique, manifestations of itself. That is the magic. Brahmadas, did, did Shiva just meow? Yeah, that was Shiva. Maybe he had a question. All right. What a, what a timely meow. So anything else from anyone about this very, very, I mean, it's just stunning what this Swami says. What we're participating in, in this, at this moment, we're only participating in because we all believe in it together. That's what is meant by the word mythology, a commonly beheld, a commonly held belief. It only sustains itself because we're doing it together. Brother Shankara, Turiya actually comes 
as you meditate uh, in a disciplined way for a long time, I can see that that awareness start coming to us. It's fearlessness, awareness, all these things start creeping into us, our mind. Turiya, Turiya is beyond definition, dear. Is it? Okay. There is no way of saying what Turiya is. Okay. The self Everything, all of our, all of our definitions mm -hmm. are within time, space, and causation. Turiya is beyond time, Much space, and time. Than it is beyond the gunas. Beyond the gunas and the liberation. So there is no way of saying. And and in our meditation, in our daily meditation, we will get very quiet. Yes. And we may actually uh, enter that great silence for some moments. But if we are honest with ourselves, when we come back from that state that we've been in, and that's what we have to call it, a state, we can't say what was there. We learned some things there, but they're beyond thought and speech. What we learned was what the Swami is teaching us here. Okay. That's how he learned it in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Thank you. This, this, he had that Nirvikalpa Samadhi uh, state. He was in that state in June of 1895. He's delivering this talk in 1896. And, the, and there, there's every reason for this to leave us a little queasy in the stomach as, as we think about this. All of this, if we learn the truth, if we come to the truth, all of this will vanish. How many of us want to have it vanish, as Swami Sarvapriyananda so sweetly said, raising his own hand. We have to admit that we continue doing this because we like it. Who likes it? The divine being itself. It's not the jiva. The jiva likes and dislikes little bits and pieces, but the whole participating in the, in the magician show, we do it because we like it. Birth goes away, and with it death. Pains fly, and with them fly away pleasures. Earths vanish, and with them vanish heavens. Bodies vanish, and with them vanishes the mind also. For that man disappears the whole universe, as it were. This searching moving, continuous struggle of this, this, this searching, moving, continuous struggle of forces stops forever. And that which was manifesting itself as force and matter, as struggles of nature, as nature itself, as heavens and earths and plants and animals and men 
and angels, all that becomes transfigured into one infinite, unspeakable, he says unbreakable, but I'm going to insert unspeakable, unbreakable, unchangeable existence. He's doing his best to speak it for us, but really he can only point to it. We have to find it for ourselves. That becomes transfigured into one infinite, unspeakable, unbreakable, unchangeable existence. And the knowing man finds that he is one with that existence. Even as clouds of various colors come before the eye, remain there for a second, and then vanish away, even so before this soul are all these visions coming of earths and heavens, of the moon and the gods, of pleasures and pains, but they all pass away leaving the one infinite blue unchangeable sky the sky never changes it is the clouds that change it is a mistake to think that the sky is changed it is a mistake to think that we are impure that we are limited that we are separate the real man is the one unit existence. The sky never changes. It is the clouds that change. It is a mistake to think that the sky is changed. It is a mistake to think that we are impure that we are limited, that we are separate. The real man is the one unit existence. So he just talked about the apparent man, the apparent human being, the human being of the mythology. And he says, all of that simply does not exist for that real human being. That real being that is having a human experience. The real human being is the one unit existence, capital U, capital E. We have time for discussion. If anyone has anything they'd like to ask or say, anything you'd like to contribute, as Haima has been and Michele did, uh, from their own wisdom, their own experience, their own sense of this. Brother. Raji. Yes, Raji. So, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of these things that are you know, only a person that who has achieved Samadhi can understand. But if I were to interpret, you know, get a taste of a little bit of that understanding, you know, in our daily lives, often we come across people who are very attached to not their body, not even their mind, but to things that they own, you know, sometimes like, especially like what kind of bag they carry, like or shoes or clothes, you know, this brand and that brand. And there's so much attached to that. And if we have got at least that level of freedom, and it's almost like the mythology, like, you know, all that agitation is a waste. And, you know, it's, it's just a illusion. Well, as, I said, Raji, for them. as I said, it is a, it is a, it is a spectrum. There are those people who are exactly as you describe them. We must not judge them. We must not think that they are in any way less. They're, they're, they are simply 
entranced with the magic. And so they have all these upadis, Sanskrit word for limitations, and all of those upadis are what they identify themselves with. So they're, they're still in the state of identifying themselves with those limitations. But all of us who are sitting here this evening have our own set of upadis, hmm? have our own set of things that we identify ourselves with. And that we that we and one of the things as as is pointed out by all the great teachers, until we really confront it, we really don't understand how much the body is itself the great limitation, how attached we are to the body and to embodiment itself. Is that a bad and wrong thing? Of course not. It's as natural as it seems to us that the sun rises and the sun sets. The sun doesn't rise, the sun doesn't set, the earth turns. But it looks to us like the sun rises and the sun sets. It looks to us like we are this body and that we need to take care of this body and all of the things that then come from being embodied. Anything else from anyone? Thank you, Rajiv. You're right, those people are like that. I mean, if it isn't Gucci, what is it? Mm -hmm. If it isn't a Ferrari, it's not really a car. I guess now the big name is Tesla. Yes, you're right, Brother Shankara. So, but it's, 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 that's why this Swami, Swami Prabhavananda would so sweetly lament as he stood on the podium. Everyone loves the magic, but no one wants to know the magician. The magician and he would go on to say, that all you're searching here and there, you're looking in all the wrong places. It's right there in the chair where you're sitting. And always was. I just would like to, um, this is Maria, Brother Chankara. Yes, Maria. I just want to add it, uh, something very important that mentioned the Bible. This is in silent, you, you know God, but um, has not been taken uh, in consideration that in, the, in all Christianity. And so, do they, uh, Christianity, they practice more the bhakti or what is central? Because many verses in the Bible indicates, you know, meditation, like at this one. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, and, and some of the great saints of the Christian tradition, like Master Meister Eckhart, said there is a great silence in us that calls to us. It is best for us to heed that call. So you're right, Maria, there is much in the Bible that points toward meditation. Much, much, much that points toward, toward, uh, toward
turn. Well, what, what does it mean to turn within? Uh -huh. It means to practice contemplation, concentration, and meditation. So that's... And Christ is very clear. Uh -huh. Seek ye first the kingdom of kingdom God, of God which is within, and yeah. all else shall be added unto you. So you're very right, Maria. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Brother Chankara. Anything else from anyone? Uh, Brother Shankara? Yes. Okay. Uh, said a question about the uh, idea of liking the mythology. Um, I mean, I... I, I, I understand like the idea of liking something because it bring, brings you pleasure but I wonder if there's like some maybe fear around liking the mythology um, because it's kind of like you know it's like a known you know it's like we all have experienced this mythology and if everyone were to uh, you know stop believing it would just create an unknown situation because you know what is known you know at, uh, up until this, you know, at this moment right now has been believing in this mythology. So is part of like, is it possible that maybe part of liking the mythology involves an element of, you know, feeling comfortable with what we know, even though we kind of, even though some people kind of know it's limited? Well, yes, but it seems to be more, all of what you said is apparently true. Liam, what, what you just said, it's, it's true of people. But it seems to be more fundamental than that. There seems to be a love of being itself, of simply seeming to be separate from the one unit existence. And there seems to be a love of creating. So we have this love of being itself and in being, we love creating. With our creating, we seem to have a love of doing, doing things. Not just creating things, but doing things with them. And then we have, we seem to have a deep love of sharing. Now, of course, that all has its opposite side, where people like to deny others their being, they, they like to deny them their creativity, which means they're projecting this, this that like the, the baby doesn't see the robber, they're seeing and it has to do with jealousy and so on. But being, creating, doing, and sharing, those seem to be four fundamental things that make up our love of this embodied existence. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that, per se. It's just limited. And the Swami is saying, the real person is not in any way limited and doesn't have any of the impurities that go along with even these purities. Does that make sense, Liam? Yes. Uh, although one, one question about that, when you refer, when the Swami refers to the real person, is he referring to the, uh, the Atman? Well, yes, that would be, he would use that word, has used that word in this talk, yes. The Atman or Brahman or, uh, he just used the, the uh, term, the English term, unit existence, which I, you know, I don't think I ever saw it outside of this talk the unit existence capital u capital e 
the one unit encompassing all existence. So that would be, that's a, a, a synonym for Atman or Brahman, yes. Got it, thank you. All right, anything else from anyone? All right, that, that's, that takes us to 8.30. And, and so now the Swami is going to pose two questions and then answer them. Two questions now arise and so on and so on. Is it possible to realize this? So far it is doctrine, philosophy and so on. But is it possible to realize it? And then he says, there is. So we'll start with reading this sentence that ends with unit existence next week. And we'll take it from there. Any final thoughts from anyone? Brother Shankara, which page, it seems like I lost my page, which page we are? I'm sorry, dear, I don't have the same page as you do. Does anyone have the page we're on? I can tell you, it's a 330. 330? 330, Maria. Okay, thank we you. We ended at the first paragraph ending, and then second, next time we'll, we'll be starting. Thank you, thank you very much. Two questions. Okay, sure. Thank you, Maria. Anything else from anyone? So then let us listen to this prayer, this ancient prayer, and, and its interpretation. Om Asato Ma Satgamaya. Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya. Mrityor Ma Amrutangamaya. Abir Abir that is normally translated simply as it's a prayer to the divine lead us from the unreal to the real the divine not out there in here lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness to light lead us from death to immortality Light us through and through with thy everlasting shining presence. So from here, these interpretations have been added. Oma satoma satkamaya, tamasoma jyotirgamaya, mrityorma amrutangamaya. Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from this realm of endless noise and relentless delusion to thine abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. And then simply lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through with thy everlasting, shining presence. But notice it is a prayer. It is a prayer to that which exists as the unit existence to share that full knowledge with us. So, any other final thought from anyone before I... Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. How do you get detached to the body when you feel that this is pain and this is hurting and all that? I know it is just the case that Shiva, Ham Shiva, the Shiva is inside, the Atma is inside. 
But how do you get detached with the body? You well, can... you, you don't get detached from the body as long as you have the parabdha karma that is causing these pains and so on. Here, You don't get detached from the body. You get detached from your love of, of embodiment. What's all of that? these aches and pains uh -huh. and all of these other things that happen as you get older. Yeah. One of their purposes, of course, is to help us, help us get detached from our love of embodiment. This is why Holy Mother says, all suffering seen properly is a blessing because it causes us to not want to take this human journey again, not yeah. want to be part of this mythology. And that is the final goal. Well, it, 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 can, it, it can come to you even before um, you leave the body, dear. Uh, this uh, this uh, sense of desire not to be embodied, this, this disenchantment with embodiment, with realizing that, oh my God, there's way too much a downside to this. There's way too much downside to this entrancement with the magic. Yes. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> we have to live through. Yeah. But Sri Ramakrishna gave us guidance. He said, don't uh, abandon the body. It's not yours to abandon. So you go to the doctor, you take care of the body as best you can. Even Totapuri, his Advaita guru, had to have that lesson that the body was not his own to dispose of as he thought. Mm. Got it. So that's a very, very in, informative part of the gospel to read. Is Sri Ramakrishna's experience with uh, with Totapuri about this business of embodiment? You know, Totapuri became so ill with amoebic dysentery mm -hmm. that he was in constant pain and couldn't meditate, mm -hmm. and so he thought, "Oh well, I'll drown myself in the Ganges. I'm through with this body." Well. I won't tell you the rest of the story. I'll let you find it out for yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll ponder over it. I have read gospel two, three times, but so I know where. Okay, so I will think through. Thank you. All right. I told us, yes, thank you. Yes. Disenchantment with the embodiment. Anything else from anyone? All right, in the meantime, until we do leave our bodies. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. Knowing that that mother and father are within us in that drawing room of our heart. Any final thought from anyone? All right. Thank you. The next, the next uh, time we'll have an opportunity to get together is Saturday when we'll study uh, from uh, noon to one, we'll study Swami Prabhavananda's interpretation of and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, a book he published under the title, How to Know God. And 
referring directly to what Swami Vivekananda said tonight, the title for Sunday's talks, Sunday's talk at 11 a.m. is Consciousness is not plural. What then are you? So that's the Sunday talk. Consciousness is not plural. What then are you? So, any final thought from anyone? All right, dears. Until Saturday or Sunday or the next time we see you. Jai Ma, Jai Ma, Jai Ma. Thank you.